The following program, Live and Learn, is made possible by Aging Partners. Find out more on their website at agingpartners at lincoln.ne.gov. We're going to talk about one of my favorite sports, and I hope one of your favorite sports, if not now, to be in the future, golf. And you know what Mark Twain had to say about golf? He said, golf is a good walk spoiled. Well, that's probably because Mark Twain didn't play golf. But let you meet a guy who really does play golf. And this guy is the administrator for City Golf. And Dale Hardy is with us today. And we're going to talk about the history of golf in our Lincoln area. And uh, you tell me that there are actually originally 18 golf courses in the area. Uh, there is now. Uh, we had one closed down uh, a few years back, but uh, uh, hopefully we don't have any more closed down because golf is a great sport and we need as many courses as we can get. And today we're going to concentrate on the city courses and the history because it's really fascinating. There was a golf course which m maybe some of you are old enough to remember. And you tell us about the original golf course in Lincolndale. The original golf course that the city first opened in 1920 was called the Antelope Golf Course. It was located in the Antelope Park, um, would be, I guess, on the south side of Normal, kind of followed Normal there. And the clubhouse actually was in the old pavilion. The old pavilion basement. Yes. That was the clubhouse. Yes. How many holes? It was 18, but it was an executive course. You know, there weren't a lot of long holes, you know, a lot of par threes, a lot of par fours. But mm -hmm. um, yeah, and it actually did close down in 1937. So it was there for 17 years. But it was a very popular course, was it, it was not? very popular. I wonder if any, did any of you out there play that? Well, I, I don't know of anybody. I, I did meet the um, assistant golf professional, uh, he came out to Pioneers years ago, and I met him, and boy, he was full of stories and stuff, and, and mm -hmm. uh, just a fascinating gentleman. Mm -hmm. Well, the golf courses that we have in Lincoln, of course, now, and the ones we're going to concentrate on, uh, Pioneers, our probably favorite course, started in 1930, Holmes in 1964, the Jim Ager uh, Golf Course for Kids was created in 1967. Mahoney in 1977, and the Highlands in 1992. All right, with the Antelope, of course, originally created in 1920, then what led to its demise and then the creation of Pioneers? Well, I believe that uh, if we go back in the history, um, it was Sand Greens, mm -hmm. and there was kind of a, uh, I guess, at that period of time, more courses were coming out with sand green, or excuse me, grass greens. Mm. So they had some land that was donated to them, which is now Pioneers Park, uh, and had the opportunity to put uh, a golf course in out there. They had more room. Uh, they thought that it would be a good, good match for a new golf course. But it originally had sand greens, mm. and there were 27 holes. At Pioneers? At Pioneers. Oh, thank goodness they got rid of that. <laughs> well, yes and no. I mean, oh. there are times we could use more holes in, in the city of Lincoln, but... But I mean, the sand greens, yes. that's what I'm talking um, about. I don't like those. And they actually did have sand traps uh, also, but uh, they did convert, start converting in the probably late 30s to grass greens, and there wasn't enough play to keep... Uh, 27 holes open, so they did close one nine down. Well, I, I love the names of the holes that they gave that original antelope. Uh, oh, yes. Yeah, they, they called them Fairview. I mean, think about it now. Fairview Lookout, and they, they oh, there's the Fairview hole, and then we have the Lookout. <laughs> That's the one I love. And here's another one. Oh, boy. That must have been a swell <laughs> one. And Westward Ho, that was the name of another one. And Long Gone and Argonne which of course would have been a battle in World War I. They named those holes. Yeah. Okay, let's, uh, let's start with the first golf course then, of course, Pioneers. Yes, yes. And you were the golf pro there for many years. I actually, obviously that's my favorite. I was a golf professional there for 24 years. Ah. Uh, so um, I, have, I have done and seen a lot and you know, it'll always be special in my heart. Mm -hmm. but. Now, the WPA was involved. The Works Progress Administration was involved in the building of, of Pioneers. They were. They actually came in in 1933. They built the clubhouse, uh, which is still there today. Mm -hmm. A lot of the sand uh, stone from the rock quarry in Roca. 
uh, were brought in, and then the big oak beams and everything, and it looks more like a big lodge you would see in a, in a like a ski resort up in the mountains or mm -hmm. something, but mm -hmm. uh, to this day, it's a very solid building. They also went down, built uh, quite a few other buildings down in the Pioneers Park itself. Uh, and that was finished all in 1933. And the CCC, the Civilian Conservation Corps, planted those trees out there because originally mm -hmm. there wasn't, there were no trees. No. I love that. Not at all. <laughs> and we do have some photos, and I wish we could share, the, share them with the uh, viewers today, but they're old and, and kind of in the archives, but they show when they were building the course out there, and there are no trees mm -hmm. at all on the horizon or anything, mm -hmm. so. Now, Pioneers is still Lincoln's most favorite course, right? Yes. It has more traffic than any. Why it do you does. think that is? I think there's several reasons. Um, I mean, some people uh, like to play it more because there's no sand traps now. Mm -hmm. uh, that, that brings in a, f a few of the people. Um, and it's typically in really good shape. It's been established for a long time. And, you know, uh, un unfortunately, sand traps take a lot of time. and. Uh, effort to maintain so without and to get those out of traps, yes <laughs> but that's where we come in to give the lessons but uh, they take a lot of time and effort uh, to maintain so they have more time to spend on the other parts of the all course, right that's but. the oldest course in town the Lincoln uh, Lincoln course uh, Lincoln City course now we're going to move on to the next one that was built which is the Holmes golf course now that was supposed to be temporary I understand the clubhouse was uh, they actually opened that in 1964 mm -hmm. and they had three trailers that they put together um, and put a roof on. Not that too many trees out there either. No, not at all. And it was temporary. Um, <laughs> 50 years <laughs> temporary, <laughs> huh? Yes, exactly. <laughs> and as you kind of look there, there are some uh, pillars on the corners. Uh -huh. Those actually are from uh, marble pillars from the second state capitol. Oh. So we have uh, now have a new clubhouse out there and we were able to save 12 of those pillars. Then, oh, are, are those, no, those, those aren't the pillars. What no, are those posts? Those posts uh, is kind of the architect's design to kind of tie this in with Holmes Lake. Mm -hmm. uh, it's kind of, uh, um, I guess Contemporary if you Contemporary or something? Well, a little bit, but it's supposed to look like sails. And if you look there on the left side, you can kind of see that blue canvas. Oh, say, oh sails. sails. Oh, wind sails. Sail I thought boats. you meant make, to make a sail. <laughs> no, well, that, that's a thought, too. Okay. <laughs> and so the, the features, what, what's the advantage of the new clubhouse as opposed to the old clubhouse? Well, first of all, the roof doesn't leak. Oh, yeah, that would help. Yeah, mm -hmm. um, and, and the plan originally was to have this clubhouse done and open in uh, January of 2013. Mm -hmm. There were a lot of delays and everything and, and different things, but um, I mean this, there's been a lot of controversy on this clubhouse, but it's a new clubhouse. It's going to serve the, the golfers uh, very well. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a lot bigger, has a gathering space, uh, and you're a little bit closer, the pro shop is a little bit closer to the golf course, so they will have better control of the golf course uh, as far as uh, uh, control uh, aspect of the clubhouse. All right, now we're going to move on to the building of our kids' golf course, oh, uh, yes. Jim, the Jim Ager course. Now that was 1967. It was. There actually was a, uh, Pioneers was the only course at the time. There were a lot of kids, believe it or not, that played golf. Mm -hmm. They were playing Pioneers and Oh, the kids were playing pioneers. Yes. Yeah, and, and they the really adults weren't, didn't like that too much. They didn't. They weren't educated. They didn't. They did. They didn't have the proper etiquette and stuff. And instead of just saying no kids, we had a group of of people back in that era that said, "Let's do something for the kids." So they went to the city and the same area where the Antelope Golf Course, the original Antelope Golf Course, was, said, "We have room here. Let's build them a golf course." They did. Uh, they got an architect. Floyd Farley came in donated his time and effort to design right, it. That's crazy. A lot of, of, of people donated time and effort and then the Home Builders Association of Lincoln built the clubhouse and donated that. So, What a, a marvelous training ground for kids to get started in golf. Yes. That's just a real special place. Who was Jim Ager? Why is it named after Jim? Jim Ager was a would be a Parks and Recreation director. I don't believe it was a director. I believe it was a superintendent at that okay. time, but that was back in the early 50s mm -hmm. when he uh, 
uh, when he was the uh, superintendent of parks at that time mm -hmm. and, and did a great job. And obviously you can see today how many parks and, and different recreations and stuff we have. So. Okay. All right, now we're going to move on to the Mahoney Golf Course, which was built in 1977. And give us a little background there, Dale. Well, that... Um, as golf became more popular and everything, we, the city realized we need more golf holes. And they had some land out there, and, and that land, along with homes, uh, had a lot to do mm -hmm. with federal uh, money that was used for parkland and, re and recreation and entertainment. So mm -hmm. those dollars were kind of put into that golf course also. And you call that a full value course. What does that mean? Well, we call that a value course because um, and it's really in as good a shape as the other courses, but it's designed a little bit different, designed to be a little easier. It's par 70, a little shorter, mm -hmm. so, mm -hmm. you know, some value in there. And now we have a golf course in the south, the middle of town, and the northeast. Northeast. And so we're going to move then to the Highlands, which is the newest course in town, and that was built in 1992, the northwest. Now, we call this a Lynx-style course. What is that? The Lynx-style course is more of a design where you, you don't irrigate as much, and it's not, at this point, a true Lynx-style course because mm -hmm. we don't maintain it to be that way. If we did, the, the rounds would slow down uh, because you have a lot of different um, areas at the course that people aren't used to. Mm -hmm. Very fast greens, very hard greens, uh, fairways are, are very fast, and you have all this tall grass just shortly uh, outside of the rough. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it is a links in the fact that there's wind always out there. There's wind, that, listen, they don't call it the high lands for nothing. <laughs> <Exactly>. <laughs> no trees, <laughs> the wind, and you got, but I always think, I call it the shortest course. If you, st if you don't get into trouble, it's a short course. If you just stay on the yep. fairway where you're supposed to be in the first place. Yeah, it's the <laughs> one course that was built with four sets of tees. So you can shorten that course up quite a bit. And, you know, for the ladies or people just starting out or even some of the seniors don't hit it quite as far. Right. That's where they should And be. I want to make that clarification between the ladies' tee, it's, don't call it that anymore, it's nope. the forward tees. Mm -hmm. Because a lot of men who are getting older wouldn't play from the ladies' tee, but it is the forward tee. So just get that into your vocabulary and talk about the forward tee so the men don't get embarrassed. Yeah, and, and that's been a struggle for us for many, many yeah, years. Yeah. Because, but we have players that are playing that have played for 60, 70 years too. Yeah. So. And they're, some of them are pretty darn good. Yes, they are. A lot of them, <laughs> lot of them believe it or not, can still shoot their age. Oh, really? That's oh, it's, it's Well, it's listen, neat. ladies and gentlemen, those of you who are of an age, and if you used to play golf or never played golf, this really is your opportunity because the, of the city golf administrator is going to have a free clinic, and this is going to be coming next April. Right, and it'll be a Jim Ager, which is the small course, not just for kids, uh, but, but for seniors. And you're going to teach people from the beginning. Tell us exactly. about this. Exactly. Uh, Scott Wyhe, our, our golf professional at the Ager Golf Course, he and I have been working on different things of trying to get people at the Ager Course. It was built and donated to the youth of, of Lincoln, but when school is in session, yeah. there's yeah. not many people playing. Yeah. Uh, so we want to try and create more players, but also create uh, for seniors because it's a, it's a type of game that you can take up at any age and still enjoy. Plus, the Eger is a great place to uh, work on your game, and if you're starting out, it, you don't have as many people pushing you. Uh, it's a shorter course, so your game improves a whole lot faster. So we will be putting on this clinic in, in April mm -hmm. at the Agri course. And we'll let everybody know about it as that time approaches, but just be thinking about it. You're never too old to play golf, and one of the reasons I love golf is you can play it as long as you, not even, I was gonna say as long as you can walk. No, you don't have to walk, you can take a cart. But it's never too late to learn this game. It is a lifelong game. Mm -hmm. I came to it very late in life. I am so sorry. Uh, but I had an attitude towards it. Mm -hmm. Well, first of all, wh where I used to live, the only golf course was the country club at the other end of town. I lived at the poor end of town, and it was golf was a game for rich old fat men. It was, who, you know, and th that's my thinking. So I didn't even pay any attention to it. And when I got the opportunity at age 50 to start, 
I have lo I've fallen in love with the yes. game. And I want to encourage you to, you're never too old to l live and learn and to learn to play golf. So be thinking about the, the possibility of joining us. You'll, you'll provide the clubs and everything for yes. everybody uh, coming up next um, April, April and we'll, we'll alert you. Dale? And I also want to mention that we have ADA accessible golf carts at that course also. And we're ready you have golf cart? Golf, golf carts, carts for at Agar? At Agar. They're ADA carts. What so is that? Oh. If you're in a wheelchair oh, or have some I type didn't of disability, know. yes. We have three of them. Oh, so. splendid. Well, then you have no excuse. Exactly. <laughs> Dale Hardy, the golf administrator for the city of Lincoln. Four. <laughs> <laughs> Ah, oh, it's really been a joy. Thank you so much. And Live and Learn is going to be right back, right after this word. What does Medicare cover? How can I afford to keep living in my home? When I need help with house and yard work, who can I turn to? Why am I so tired? Am I eating right? Should I exercise? Where can I go for answers to my questions about aging? Aging Partners is the place to call when you have questions on aging. Our experts are here to help you with unbiased answers for you or your loved ones. Aging Partners, we're only a phone call away. Welcome back to Live and Learn. I'm Dolores Lintel, one of the hosts. I think we can all agree that a good night's sleep is a beautiful thing, and it's not always easy to achieve. So today I have as my desk Dr. Keith Richmouth, who is with Nebraska Pulmonary Specialties, and he's going to give us some information that will help us solve our problems. So welcome to the show, Doctor. Thank you. Uh, can you tell us uh, just some basic what the uh, body needs from sleep and how much is required? And yes. Some? Well, sleep's obviously a very important uh, part of our physical being. We spend roughly, or are supposed to spend roughly a third of our life doing it. I don't think we have all of the information about sleep. It's probably one of the areas of medicine that we uh, have a lot to learn about yet. Mm -hmm. Um, it, we know it's important in rejuvenation, uh, recharging of both the brain and the, and the body. And disturbances in sleep are a common problem, uh, especially if you look at the elderly uh, population. Random surveys have shown about 50% oh, of patients yeah. will complain of, of uh, some sort of sleep disturbance. Right. The difficulty is that both a primary disturbance of sleep, mm -hmm. such as sleep apnea, which would be a common problem, uh, can disrupt sleep, but also other conditions can disrupt sleep, other medical conditions, okay. psychological, psychiatric, um, you know, even medications, those sure. kind of things. So, so it's, a, it's a very common problem. Okay. Uh, you mentioned sleep apnea is the, probably the most common or the one we recognize the most. Can you tell us about that and what the symptoms are and then what can be done? Absolutely. It is very common if you look at uh, patients over the age of 60. Um, the prevalence appears to be around 19 to 20 percent really? or so in recent uh, e evaluations of that. Mm -hmm. the, the thing you hear most commonly about sleep apnea, apnea means to stop breathing and so a cessation of breathing or disruption of breathing that occurs when we sleep most commonly because of obstruction of the airway when we go to sleep mm -hmm. muscles relax that o keep our airway open when we're awake like this and in some people that relaxation can cause enough compromise of the airway to disturb breathing. I see. Uh, but there's other types of sleep apnea where the brain doesn't communicate with the lung to breathe and those kind of things. So it's it's a really common, most commonly obstructive. The symptoms uh, simply are, and they can vary. Mm -hmm. um, snoring is the thing you hear most about with obstructive apnea, but okay. not, not everybody snores. Okay. Um, and then of course, you know, wakening through the night for unclear reasons. Um, actually sleep apnea can cause insomnia and then tiredness during the day and those kind of things. Um, and sleep apnea is a very important disease we've learned over the past decade it actually has major implications on other diseases, especially cardiovascular disease. That was one of my questions, how it affected your overall health. And, and, and that's, yeah. that's probably the thing we have the most evidence for, but um, there, there have been several other things. Just in the mm -hmm. past uh, two years, there's been a study looking at women over the age of 70. Those who had sleep apnea had a higher risk of dementia. Really? Yes. Oh. Uh, the theory is that the night after night disturbances of sleep and oxygen reductions okay. cause some disruption in the some injury to the brain, so to speak. Right. Um, metabolic disturbances, weight gain. M there's some link with diabetes, um, those kind of things. So it has, you know, even even depression and, mm -hmm. and those kind of diseases. Uh, so it, it does have some major implications besides how it makes somebody feel. Okay. Uh, even it, separate from that, it seems right. to cause some other problems. Okay. Now you mentioned insomnia. Um, 
how, how is that diagnosed or what are the symptoms and then what can be done Absolutely. about that? Insomnia is another very common problem. Again, more common, it seems to be more common in the, in the elderly. Um, and, and again, it's probably the classic condition where it can be because, well, and in fact, I would say probably more commonly insomnia is caused by something else. In other words, uh, maybe okay. a, another disease. It's not um, a, a physiological. Yes, yeah. it, it can be physiologically, but I think if you look at the you know, overwhelming evidence, it's more okay. commonly caused by something. Okay. It's simply diagnosed um, you know, clinically by taking a very good history from the patient. You know, um, are they having trouble getting to sleep? Are they waking up? One misconception is that we, we label somebody as insomnia as if the sleep disruption, you know, their inability to mm -hmm. fall asleep or stay mm -hmm. asleep is causing them, you know, uh, distress or disturbance and those kind of things. So it, it's kind of a downward spiral. You don't get enough sleep, so you get stressed out and you go back, try to get to sleep and it happens again and you just, it repeats itself. Right, and, that, and that's a, that is a common yeah. um, vicious cycle that occurs. Yeah. Um, and so. We diagnose it, you know, off of a careful history uh, that, that should be done with the patient. Um, patients with insomnia do often need a sleep study, though, because okay. we want to rule out a primary problem during their sleep, like sleep apnea or, mm -hmm. or other conditions. So they often do still need to come in for a sleep study. All right. Uh, but the, really, the crux of the diagnosis for insomnia is a, a good history. Okay. All right. Now, uh, what are some of the things that we can do if we feel just not well and we're tired? Can, should we? try to self-medicate with some of the over-the-counter um, uh, prescription or medicines available out there mm -hmm. and try to help ourselves, or is that not the way to approach it? Well, what I would say is I'm always a believer if you can do something without a medicine, you know, you're, you're better off. So before uh, somebody would jump at, at going after one of the over-the-counter medicines like Tylenol PM or those kind of things, um, I would probably take a careful assessment of what your sleep habit and patterns are. Mm -hmm. The mistakes people make commonly as it relates to sleep hygiene sort of things are that they will watch TV, you know, up until the time they go to bed and even in bed, definitely a, a you know, no-no. Okay. Even on the computer, you know, all this, the day of electronic ages with iPads sure. and Kindles and those kind of, the games and so forth. Well, and I know people who can't sleep and then they get up and do things on the computer. Yes, and, that, <laughs> and that's another big thing that we stress yeah. in the sleep clinic with regards to patients who have insomnia. Yeah. And again, you know, people will ask, well, is it bad to do these things? You know, if you don't have insomnia and you sleep well, you, these may not be applicable to right. you, but it's if you have insomnia, these are things that sort of perpetuate it or maybe the cause of it. Yeah. Um, so uh, those kind of things, um, you know, having a, a set schedule, you know, this is my bedtime, this is my awakening time. And I think it's, as you pointed out, when you go to bed, if you're not able to fall asleep, the rule of thumb is 30 to 60 minutes. You shouldn't lay there fighting to get to sleep. You should actually get up. Now don't go out and watch TV or have a cup of coffee, do something yeah. relaxing. Um, that was a surprise to me because what occurred to me is if you have trouble getting to sleep, you should at least be in the proximity of where you want to sleep. Mm -hmm. And you know, proximity, I would say living room, something like that, but out of the bedroom, out of, okay. the, of the bed, because it, it creates this psychological battle in, in the patient in that they lay there thinking, I gotta get to sleep, yeah. I gotta get to sleep, and they will fight. Mm -hmm. And that's what we wanna try to avoid. And so you remove yourself from that position, kind of go back out in the mm -hmm. living room, you know, music or, or reading or something like that until the brain okay. starts to feel sleepy again then come back into the bedroom and lay okay. down. The big thing though is if that takes you two hours to do that process, yeah. so it's not till midnight till you finally fall asleep. Right. The mistake people make is then when they normally would have wanted to get up at seven, now they go ahead and sleep until nine or 10, then that's not good because then the next night's gonna be the same. Oh. You wanna keep the awakening time the same. And okay. so keep it at that seven o'clock. You, you didn't get as much sleep definitely that night, but what that in, is intended to do is generate a little bit more sleep drive Okay. So that when you go to bed the next night at 10 o'clock, okay. you'll hopefully be able to fall asleep. Okay, so it's a pattern, a continuous, yes. so it tells your brain, okay, now it's time to sleep. Correct. And right. now it's time to get up. Right, exactly. So being consistent, and whether that's weekdays, weekends, um, you know, and we're all going to vary a little bit. What I'm talking about is major variations. Yeah. Try to be consistent and, and limit those major variations. Okay. Um, what What are some things that affect you directly, like diet, caffeine, mm -hmm. sugar, chocolate, mm -hmm. some of those things that... Yeah, very good question. Um, caffeine has a big impact on sleep. Again, not in everybody. I mm -hmm. mean, if somebody doesn't have insomnia and they can have a soda or a cup of coffee at five o'clock and still sleep fine at night, yeah. I'm not talking yeah. about that individual, but somebody who has insomnia, we recommend they cut out caffeine 
you know, probably at least six hours before their preferred bedtime. Okay. And, and you're right, uh, coffee, soda, even chocolate. So somebody's eating chocolate before bedtime isn't good. Diet, kind of the same thing, maintaining consistent diet. It's not good to eat, you know, close to bedtime. Um, again, if you're hungry and that's going to keep you from getting to sleep, you might have yeah. to eat a little something. But yeah. big meals before bedtime aren't good because it kind of disrupts our circadian rhythm. The okay. normal, you know, because when you eat at that time, the brain says, okay, it's now time to be awake. Okay. Um, so you want to avoid that. I mean, other kind of, some of these things are, you know, what our moms always told us, they, they were right. I mean, a warm <laughs> bath before bed, yeah. um, even something like warm milk, that's yeah. okay. Um, but, but those kind of big meals, um, alcohol as well, it's not good right. to have alcohol before bedtime. Um, you know, and th those kind of things are, okay. are big. What about um, exercise and napping, those mm, kind of? Good question as well. Again, if you have insomnia, the best time to exercise is in the morning or, or the afternoon. Mm -hmm. You want to avoid exercise in the late afternoon, early evening, or certainly, you know, night. Sure. Because that, again, stimulates the brain uh, and will keep it from being able to go to sleep. Right. Napping, um, you know, there's nothing wrong with some short naps if, if you need them. Yeah. And, and you have the luxury of being able to do right. that. Nothing wrong with that. Again, the insomniac has to um, avoid taking long naps. Um, uh, in the in the afternoon or morning because then that's going to affect their ability to sleep at night. Mm -hmm. So I think every individual is a little different with regards to napping, but we do um, focus on trying to limit naps in patients who have insomnia because if you sleep for two hours between noon and two, it's going to be hard for you to go to bed at right. nine o'clock. Um, okay. your, your sleep drive's not there, and yeah. and so it, it just depends. Yeah. Um, now, uh, is all of the uh, testing and so forth that's required to diagnosis, is that covered by Medicare and insurance? Yes. I mean, complaints <coughs> of insomnia and, you know, let's say snoring, mm -hmm. tiredness during the day, all are important things that when you see your physician, um, you know, those are all indications to do a sleep evaluation. And oftentimes, as I mentioned, that includes a sleep study mm -hmm. in one of the sleep labs. But it should be referred by your primary physician, or can you just come on your own? No, you, you need to have that ordered by a physician, primary right. physician, or sleep specialist. Okay. Uh, so it does need to be ordered. You can't mm -hmm. refer yourself to a sleep lab, you, you know, independently. Right. Okay. Uh, All right. Well, I think we've covered a good deal here. Is there anything else that we should talk about? You mentioned the, the stress. Is there any way that a person can learn to deal with, with stress if they think that's a major problem. They go to bed with these problems on their mind and they just wrestle with them all night. Yes, I mean that's an important thing in that um, what you want to try to do, do and it's easier said than done and, and we're all going to have different levels of stress in our life at different times yeah. and you want to avoid that stress causing you a persistent uh, problem with uh, sleep disturbances. So doing things like relaxation, meditation, I mean it's, it's a, it can be a very helpful thing. You want to try to set aside time before bed, mm -hmm. um, you know, whatever time that's best mm -hmm. for you, to try to kind of, um, again, meditate, sort of get those things off your chest, even writing them down, the things mm -hmm. that you think are going to stress you out, so that when you go into that bedroom, into that bed, you can try to put that aside. Okay, a make a to-do list and then you can lay it aside forget and it. forget about it. Till the morning. Okay. Um, I think uh, sometimes we, we try too hard to sleep and it just keeps on bothering us. So it's important that we get an important diagnosis of what, it, I mean an accurate diagnosis so we know exactly what's wrong. I completely agree. And so they come to you and how is that accomplished? Well again, they could be referred by their primary care doctor or they can absolutely contact our office mm -hmm. and we can, we can get them in. We, we see uh, in, in our office probably a Oh, I bet a third of our patients are sleep-related problems. Again, mm -hmm. sleep apnea, insomnia, those kind of things. And so they can, um, in that case, they can self-refer to our office. But mm -hmm. if you have a good, you know, establishment with your primary care doctor, it's always good to start with them. Okay. All right. Well, doctor, you've just given us a lot of good information, and I think uh, we'll all sleep better tonight. <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> Thank you very much You're for You're welcome. Thank you for having uh -huh. me. And Live and Learn, we'll be right back. What does Medicare cover? How can I afford to keep living in my home? When I need help with house and yard work, who can I turn to? Why am I so tired? Am I eating right? Should I exercise? Where can I go for answers to my questions about aging? Aging Partners is the place to call when you have questions on aging. Our experts are here to help you with unbiased answers for you or your loved ones. Aging Partners, we're only a phone call away. 
Welcome to Live and Learn. I'm Sam Truax, and today I'm honored to have Lancaster County Commissioner Roma Amundsen as my guest. Uh, it'll be interesting to talk about county issues, but today we're going to talk about her career. Commissioner Amundsen was the first female general grade officer in the Nebraska Army National Guard in its 165 year history. So that means, oops. What's that? He wants you to look at her when you're talking about her. Oh, okay. Okay. So, okay, let's get the rules down here. Mm -hmm. So, so we should look at each other when yeah, we. Yeah, so basically just act like it's. Kind of a natural sort yeah, of thing. Yeah, so just act like it's a conversation just oh, between okay. you two. Oh, um, we can do that. Look, when you do your. Uh, your quick little intro, look, look at the camera. When you do your quick little outro, look at the camera. But other than that, just act like it's just because Yeah, I was still in my intro, but I should look away I, before I that, huh? Just shorten up your intro just a little bit. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm going to say all that. i got to say all that, so. Yeah, yeah he says just, right? just, just uh, look at her, just acknowledge her. Yeah, okay. Okay. There you go. All right, let's stand back. Welcome to Live and Learn. I'm Sam Truax, and today my guest is Lancaster County Commissioner Roma Amundsen. Now, it would be interesting to talk about county issues, but we're going to talk about her career. Commissioner Amundsen was the first female general grade officer in the Nebraska Army National Guard's 165-year history. So that means you became a an army general, pros progressed into an army general, right, Roma? Well, that's, ac that's absolutely right. Um, I became a brigadier general in um, July of 2009, and then I retired on April 30th of 2011. And so at my retirement, I also uh, was promoted to major general in the Nebraska Army National Guard. So it was really quite a career. And you started as a private, or did you start oh. come out of an RT <laughs> ROTC program? No, or? no, 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 no. I went to... Um, uh, I enlisted into the Army Reserve in April of 1978, and I went in as a specialist third class, okay? And uh, went through basic training, came out as a specialist fourth class, and then I, uh, in probably about five months after that, then I went into the, uh, um, into training for an officer, yeah, officer candidate officer school. Officer candidate school, yeah, mm -hmm. so it's, yeah. yeah. At, what kind of a background or experience would uh, have directed <coughs> you to a military <coughs> career, which wasn't really a popular career well, option for actually, women. Actually, in 19, in, during the 70s, it was not a popular career option. Right. But actually, really, during that particular period of time, the, um, the draft was eliminated, and they were really, really asking for women to come into the garden. So they did have some really good programs. But as to my background, I do come from, uh, well, my parents did, my, my dad did not serve in the military, but my brother did. Okay, and then I had many uncles who also served in the military. And I think that one of the most interesting things that I ever experienced was when I had a great uncle, my great uncle William, who served in World War I in France. I had my uncle Bert, who served in um, World War II in Germany, and then my brother, who had just returned from, Viet from Vietnam. They, we spent an afternoon together, and all of these three guys just talked about their military experiences and everything like this, and I was absolutely fascinated. We spent the whole afternoon talking about that, and you know, when you get into the history of that, it was really interesting. The other thing, too, though, is, is that why I got into the military. Um, in 1975, I studied in Germany. At, and then also in 1977, I was a tour guide in Germany. And during that period of time, the United States dollar was really uh, experiencing some difficulties. Many of the people in Europe uh, kind of snickered at some of the things that were happening in the United States. And all of a sudden, I discovered a sense of patriotism. And I said, you can't talk to me about, you can't talk about my country like that. And then the other thing that came back was um, many of the Vietnam veterans were coming back. And the, if you remember the country yes. at that time, uh, they were really negative about the Vietnam vets, and my brother was one yes. of those. And yes. I said, listen, you don't talk about people who have served their country in that way. There was one day I was sitting in the teacher's lounge. I was a teacher at the time. <clears throat> I was sitting in the teacher's lounge, and there were a few derogatory comments made about the military. And I went down that very next day 
to the Army Reserve Center, and I enlisted. And that was my way of protest. So I guess the thing about it is, is that um, I just, that it was a means of protest for me. And so I did that. And they came back and the, they were shocked at what I had done. <laughs> the third reason why I actually really did it was because I really, it, it seemed to fill this desire for a new adventure, a new yeah. for travels, for a different style of education and everything like this. I didn't give up my teaching job. I went into the military on part-time basis as a national, as Army Reservist, later as National Guardsman. And um, it was perfect. I just loved it. And, you know, what began as a four-year experience, what began as a four-year, what I had enlisted for four years, came, became a lifetime of service to people and really concern for our nation. So it's patriotism and desire for adventure and service. And yep, yeah, exactly. Uh, all of that. Well, mm -hmm. didn't you experience some resistance to <laughs> your progressing through the ranks in that male-dominated profession? Well, now Sam, <clears throat> you served for a long time with the military, also, didn't you? Yes. In the, as as an engineer. And uh, I think that you probably know the answer to that question. Yes, I did receive, there was, some, there was some resistance and there was a lot of questioning as to whether or not that I could really yeah, do it. Yeah. You know, but the fact of the matter is, is that I came in when I was in my late 20s, early 30s, and um, actually 29, I became an officer in 31, when I was 31. Um, I was not a young officer to be pushed around. <laughs> And I think, you know, that after Amen. a period of time, people learn to appreciate the fact that I did understand leadership, that I could command, that I could pass all my PT tests, my physical fitness tests, that I could shoot a weapon, and that I did well in all the educational sorts of things. And later on, you know, I just continued through the ranks and yes. eventually became a general. Yes, that's one thing about the military is you have specific steps you have to oh, go yeah. to to progress uh -huh. through the ranks. And so yeah. you have to be a college graduate to become a major and you have to mm -hmm. have a command post at mm -hmm. one time and all that. Oh, and yeah. you and apparently did all that because you became a general. So. And, and after, <clears throat> after you reach that major position, as, as a major, a officer, then when yeah. you start going into lieutenant colonel and colonel and general, those selection boards are at the national level. Yes. And so they look at all of the records and everything like this, and so those decisions are made at the national level by no. a, uh, a very disinterested group of people. Well, that's, that's an adventure in itself, but mm -hmm. actually, again, I promote the fact that military is an interesting profession, and it, it does give you a lot of adventure. It does. So, mm -hmm. well, what are some of the interesting aspects of your military career? Were you deployed or any <laughs> other, other? Actually, you know, I tell you what, there are so many, many things that I could talk to you about. We could spend a whole day talking about that. But really, I think the thing that was most fascinating to me was the variety of people that, whom I met. The, from all walks of life and from all across the nation and from even around the world too. And I think that I'm very much a people person and I think that that was one of the things that I appreciated the most, meeting the people, learning to know about them, and then interacting with them. Other things that I think were really interesting was, um, <clears throat> well, actually, uh, one, of my, one of my favorite assignments was when I was a director of facilities and engineering, and that's when I met you. Yep. Okay, and I served there and was traveled all across the state. Another most gratifying and interesting uh, assignment that I had was when I was commanding the 92nd Troop Command. It's a brigade level, and this was during 2004 to 2008, the most active time when, when the National Guard was called up for service in Iraq and Afghanistan. And I also had members, I had uh, units of the um, 67th Area Support Group Command assigned to me also. I commanded 3,500 soldiers across Nebraska. <clears throat> and I think that that was probably, even more so than as a general, that was probably the most gratifying and rewarding experience because I really felt as though I was interacting with the soldiers. Mm -hmm. I really felt as though I was serving them, making sure that their training was on track, making sure that they were deploying okay. And when they came home, getting them reintegrated with their families and, and just continuing with the work in Nebraska. Uh, and that, I think, was really one of the most interesting things. You no, know, I, have, I have both corporate and military experience in my career, and I find that the military supports each other as a group a lot more 
than the corporate mm -hmm. people who compete with each other because they're afraid someone's going to get their job or things like that. The military really supports people. I mean, the, the people in it. The thing is, is that when you're talking about the military, you're talking about a team. Yes, that's right. And you know, <clears throat> you cannot achieve your goal unless you are working as a team. And so uh, your survival depends upon someone else working with you and vice versa. Uh, and you've also heard the statement, you know, that um, you do not leave a comrade behind. Yes. And so you never leave a comrade behind. That is the idea of the military, and that yes. is what is so crucial to the teamwork and yes. what makes us as a, Support. as we call, a military family. Well, again, you really are a military family. You're, your husband is a retired military <coughs> and still works with the National Guard, and you're a beekeeper, and you dabble in real estate sales and all Don't that. Don't forget that we have a son in the military, too. Yes. Okay, and he is... He is a captain. <clears throat> He's uh, stationed at Offutt Air Force Base. He has deployed six times wow. to the Middle East. And that particular picture that's showing up there on the screen, he was flying in his RC-135 over Afghanistan. And that was presented to the family uh, as, uh, you know, as having been over Afghanistan. So he serves in the military. And so, yes, we, d we are a military, a military family. Military family, mm -hmm. yep. And, but with that kind of a background, you could actually say of a lot of achievements in my career, I can retire and take care of my bees, and <laughs> instead of that, <clears throat> you, yeah. you took on the responsibility of becoming a county commissioner, so why you know, didn't you just retire yeah. and say, that's it? Well, you know something, Sam. <laughs> hey, did you just retire? Uh, I retired, and I didn't really retire. And you really didn't retire. <laughs> you know, from retirement, you go into something else. Yes. And you know, I think that it is just a step into a different field. And actually, after I retired, I, feel, I felt as though I still had some service left mm -hmm. in me. And anyway, um, I was asked to run for Lancaster County Commissioner. And so I thought about it. And I said, well, you know, I could do that. Mm -hmm. And, and so I did, and you I did, uh, yes. yeah, and so I, I really, uh, yeah, I really enjoy, uh, I enjoyed the the race, and I also enjoyed the service. Well, again, you have, so you have some pictures of your promotions in the career that we could show, hmm. and so uh, yeah, there you go. There's, uh, oh yeah, the yeah. governor is promoting you to brigadier general again. That's not achieved by very many people, men or women. So you, you definitely attended to your duties to get that <laughs> far. Well, you have to, as I've talked with soldiers throughout my career, it's you have to always keep your eye on the next level. And I often told people that what they had to do, and this is what I did too, by the way, so I'm just not, <clears throat> when I became a second lieutenant, I bought the first lieutenant's bar. When I became a first lieutenant, I bought the, the captain's, captain's yeah. tracks, and then from there, and when I became a colonel, I bought the star. Now, I didn't know for sure if I would make that star, but you know, yeah. the fact of the matter is always keep your eye on that next yeah. level, Try write down what it is that you have to do, and then make sure you do that, yeah, and always make that little extra effort. There you go. You try and work at that level, even though you're at mm -hmm. your, your yeah. level, and so I, I mm -hmm. agree with that. Mm -hmm. So <coughs> I know that you're still concerned about some of the military issues, mm -hmm. like particularly, and you mentioned the fact that when the Vietnam veterans came home, they were mm -hmm. not well treated at all. Mm -hmm. And yeah. uh, I think m f folks with the military background try and overcome that, <laughs> that background. And mm -hmm. you're kind of thinking about that yourself. <coughs> well, actually, when it comes to, to taking care, of, I am still very much interested in the military issues. And actually, sequestration is a huge issue because it really does impact our readiness. And I'm very, very worried about what is going to happen if we continue down this present track of sequestration. Something needs to <coughs> happen because otherwise we will become um, definitely short in our military prowess. Uh, I'm very much concerned about the returning veterans with many of their medical issues. Uh, <clears throat> about the high unemployment rate among veterans, yes. and that is one That's of the big things. I think that, uh, and I know that we, there are many employers within, the, within Nebraska, within the Lincoln area, who are going out of their way to find uh, yes. veterans who are capable of working in their particular yes. jobs. Uh, I'm very much concerned also about um, continuing our education benefits for our military because sequestration has been affecting that too. And, um, you know, <clears throat> our son was telling us 
just last night that you know the refueling training for the planes has been has been cut back because of the National Guard requirements being sequestered, and mm -hmm. so that is a, that's a huge impact. So well, basically, I'm still very much worried about the military, about the no. general mor morale of the troops, and yes. I'm still there. Yes, <laughs> yes, and, <coughs> and I do want employers to know that that the military training does require mm -hmm. huge responsibilities for the younger men, and so they can carry that acceptance of responsibility into most of the companies. Actually, many do. of the companies are act actively seeking yes. mid-level managers from the military. And Forbes magazine <coughs> was talking about that, and they like that mid-manager experience yes, from the military. I'd like to thank today's guest, yeah, Commissioner Roma Amundsen, mm -hmm. or should I say General Amundsen. <laughs> Live and Learn will return shortly. What does Medicare cover? How can I afford to keep living in my home? When I need help with house and yard work, who can I turn to? Why am I so tired? Am I eating right? Should I exercise? Where can I go for answers to my questions about aging? Aging Partners is the place to call when you have questions on aging. Our experts are here to help you with unbiased answers for you or your loved ones. Aging Partners, we're only a phone call away. Welcome back to Live and Learn. I'm Harlan Johnson. And I go back in the days when the early television and you stood out in front of the department stores, you watched most anything that was on, you know, maybe it was just two or three channels, but it was interesting and it kept you glued there. A lot of interesting shows and Lincoln was a, an original spot for a lot of things like children's television. Now my guest today was a part of that. Lita Powell Drake. Lita was on a number of shows with local television. And so, Lita, it's good to have you as our guest today. Thank you for being on Live and Learn. And you're one of our hosts for Live and Learn. <laughs> it's good to be back. That video was shot 45 years ago. This outfit is 45 years old, and it's difficult to breathe. <laughs> And I have no blood supply. Well, and you should be glad that you, know, you can fit into and it. Calamity Leah. Kate did not wear glasses at that time, but they sure are a great help. All right. Now, uh, in the early television, you can probably tell us about some interesting personalities, interesting anecdotes. Uh, let's go into some of that. All right. We're going to talk about uh, many of the television shows, the children's television shows that were on channels 10, 11. Uh, back from the 1950s up until the 1980s. And this is going to be part of the Senior History Month that will be coming up on September the 25th right here in Lincoln. So I want to kind of give you an idea that I hope you'll be joining us for that lunch on Wednesday, September the 25th. But we'll go back to the origin of Cartoon Corral, which was 1957 at KOLN, KGIN Television with none other than Sheriff Bill and Silent Orv. Now, Sheriff Bill is Bill Hemke, and uh, he was the operations manager at Channel 1011. And they decided they wanted a live kids show, so therefore, we're going to get somebody from the floor crew, which would be Orville Wissing, and make him silent. So it was really fascinating that, that Orv never spoke, but kids were always trying, you know, prodding him, coming to get him to speak. And he would never speak and he would never smile. He just did his job. So they, d they did the show, the Cartoon Corral with Sheriff Bill and Silent Orb, uh, Channel 10 11, for uh, 10 years. And then Sheriff Bill decided to mosey on out to the Arizona Territory. So that's when Calamity Kate made an appearance. And this was in 1967. <laughs> Now, your kids were on a Cartoon oh, yes. Corral. Well, you know, it was a bucket list for oh. every kid oh. to be on Calamity Kate. Yes. <laughs> well, I did the show for a long time, 
And actually, Cartoon Corral was one of the longest running local children's TV shows in the country at 25 years. So there were lots of wonderful experiences that happened, which I will share with you. We don't have time to do that today, but if you'll come to the lunch, uh, we'll be sharing some of those stories and the fascinating and the things that kids said and did you will not believe. Well, you, you're <laughs> almost, you can have the Art Link letter list there probably. <laughs> of kids say the uh, darndest yes, things yes. and they did. They did do that. <laughs> well, now I know the kids came from miles away because uh, fellows that I went to school with, their children came from more than 100 miles. Well, remember the Channel 1011 signal covers 72 counties in Nebraska. And so Kansas. We, yes, in, yep. yes, in northern Kansas. So kids were coming from Benkelman, Nebraska, out near the border, North Platte, Hastings, Kearney, all the wonderful small towns. And it was a big deal. The family loaded up the car, made it a whole day event to come in. And so it was important to those little kids in Bassett, Nebraska, and, and Grand Island. And of course, we eventually had a studio, Channel 11, in Grand Island in the Yancey Hotel. So that made it easier after a while, but because sometimes we would go out and tape a segment of the show called The Quiz Kids. And those kids who lived in western, central and western Nebraska could come to KGIN TV in Grand Island, and the kids living west would come, to, or east, would come to KOLN TV, 40th and Vine Street here in Lincoln. Okay. Well, uh, you know, there's, there's a number of pictures that we can put up of, of your early guests and, and people that were involved with the show. But what we're focusing on today, I, I want to bring this in, is the Senior Citizen History Month. And, and talk to us about, you. we talk about the show here, uh, what's going to happen? I know you're going to be the, the person that's going to be putting on a show there. Yeah, it's coming up Wednesday, September the 25th. It's going to be at the Fireman's Hall. Now, if you don't know where that is, do you know where the Sun Valley um, bowling lanes are? And um, the motor car place, Speedway Motors, that's the little area right there on Sun Valley. Fireman's Hall, it's very nice. And uh, we'll be there at 1030. Come at 1030 in the morning, and we'll be talking about all the things that happened, not only on Cartoon Corral, but Romper Room and for children only, and most of the children's programs that were on TV for an hour, about an hour. Come ask questions and enjoy. Uh, a, a donation of $2 would be very, very welcome. If you want to stay for lunch, that's great. Lunch is only four oh, bucks. Four bucks. Four, yeah. we, four bucks. We're going back to the prices of the 1950s. <laughs> four dollars for lunch. But if you want to come, please, we ask you to call in order to make a reservation so we got enough food for everybody. So the number will be on the screen at 402 area code 441-7158. That's, and they do need a reservation, do they? Well, if they're going to eat. Oh, okay. You know, going to All eat, right. just All right. eat. But otherwise, just come on out. We're going to have, we're going to have lots of fun. And, and transportation is available for that. Yes, and $4, $4, $4 for dollars. transportation. Okay. So make sure up. you call okay. the number. So no right. reason for you not to come and go back and relive some of the old memories. Now, I saw your show out at the uh, uh, center the other day uh, of you doing the television. I was impressed. I learned a lot of well, stuff. That's what this is all about. Uh, yeah. This is live and learn, Harlan. Oh, oh yes, <laughs> so I've heard that word before. Gonna, we're yes. going to show what it was like in the old days when everything was live. And if you made a mistake, you dealt with it. Ah, <laughs> uh, there we are. That's uh, Romper Room? Yes. Okay. And that is Miss Cindy Wanick, who uh, was the yes. last the Romper familiar. Room teacher. Actually, there were seven Romper Room teachers through the course of time. Uh, back in 1964 is when it first started on the air. And Nancy Spearman, uh, whose husband, Bob Spearman, was in the journalism department of the University of Nebraska. She was the first romper room teacher. And then Miss Ann, or Brianna, because the kids couldn't, couldn't pronounce Brianna. So she was Miss Ann Buteau, now Brianna Benjamin, who has moved back to Lincoln, I'm happy to say. Um, so she was on there, and then Lin the darling Linda Phipps, who started the cookie company in Lincoln, Linda Phipps. Okay. And then, I'm going to tell you this. Romper Room would not allow teachers, who were all women, if they got pregnant after three months, <laughs> they had to leave the show. 
That sounds like the yeah, 50s. Uh, yeah. yeah, yeah. And so she had to leave the show. So another Linda came in, Linda Powers, who was the wife of Warren Powers, who was a football coach at the University of Nebraska. And then Linda Phipps had her baby, came back, and then Diane Elric took over, and then Donna Frohart Gailey, she's the only one of the seven teachers who's no longer with us. She passed away several years ago. But everyone else is alive, and of course Cindy Wanick, who was the final teacher. And a number of the people that were on your show, yourself included, had other responsibilities in the studio. Oh, that's that's a key. <laughs> Most of us were already employees of Gail and Gay okay. and Television. And this was an extra thing that you did, you know, and it's live. And so you, you put your regular work aside and run into the studio and do a show and, and then get back to work. That's well, what Sheriff Bill and Silent Orb and everybody Putting on that costume probably was well, not <laughs> no, any easy little trick. No, but. listen, it's more difficult today than it was then because okay. I can't breathe <laughs> and it does not fit. <laughs> but we don't worry about little things like that, okay. do we? <laughs> uh, well, I think you look pretty good in it there, Lita. Uh, I'm impressed that you can still <laughs> still wear it. Uh, there's a lot of people that couldn't do that. Uh, now, oh, wait, I just want to okay. do one all thing right. because uh, all of oh, 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 I had to because remember on Romper Room, the, the the, had, you had the little do be, do be a good child and clean your plate. And Romper, Bomper, Stomper, Boo, tell me, tell me, tell me, do. All you little children at play, have you had have all your fun today? <laughs> anyway, there was so much fun stuff going on. We're going to capture some of those things. All right. Well, now, I want to make sure that they've got that uh, number up there. So uh, our, our production crew will put the number of the 402-441-7158 for the uh, show that's going to be out at the uh, uh, fire barn. Fire Hall. Fireman's fire Hall. Hall. Firefighters. I think they got fire, Firefighters Hall. Oh, that's right. Yeah. Right. Firefighters. Can't say firemen anymore. Yeah. Firefighters. Okay. All right. Well, Lita, uh, what do we have as far as uh, some other personalities? Well, uh, of course, the Reverend Dale Holt. And for children only, Sunday morning's two-hour program, Dale Holt was a Lutheran minister and a dear, dear, intelligent, articulate, marvelous man that I cannot say enough good about. And the little mouse, Morty Mouse, from Mordecai in the Bible, from the book of Esther, uh, Dale actually made that mouse. Dale had a background in theater and radio and okay, television yeah, at the university. Yeah. And he handmade that mouse. And it lasted over 20 years. The program was on the air for 20 years before it went off. And the mouse is now in the State Historical Society. That's where Morty Mouse has 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 his. It's a, it's a he. It was all the handlers were always girls, but he he his mouse's house and his cheese are sitting over there in the State Historical Society. So. All right, uh, and oh, there's a familiar couple of faces. Oh boy, Wayne West, of course, uh, hosted a children's theater that was started in 1957, called Juvenile Theater. Lots of talent, wonderful talent, came from all over the city, and they performed in areas, you know, in in um, out at Pion Pioneers Park, and in a lot of the Kiwanis Club, and people would invite them all. They're really talented kids, and in John Ludwig, yeah. who also was on the morning show, and he played the guitar and sang, and and Wayne West was an extraordinary musician, very very talented. And he played by ear. He could play anything that the child needed or change keys while they were doing it without music. So he was really something. But now when, when, when he wasn't available, I guess who would fill in for Wayne West? The very talented Dorothy Unger Appleby, Appleby and sure. Sarah Murdoch. Yes, oh, yeah. there's Sarah. There's Sarah who, who played the organ and the piano at the same time for many years on the morning show on Woman's World and helped out with juvenile theater. And she was an extraordinary, extraordinary lady. And so many of the people that we have just talked about have passed on. And so I want to recapture those memories of, of those very, very, spe very special people who were so important in our lives when there were only three television stations. And yeah. a lot of people in the western part of the state could only receive one, one. Channel 1011, yeah. because that beaver crossing tower, that signal was beaming out to 72 counties all over the state. And so it was indeed 1011 strong. 
All right. Well, we've seen some of the personalities. This has been just kind of a teaser of what yes. the show is oh, going to be like. Oh, we got lots uh, to come. I know you've got you got plenty of stuff to to fill. And I want to tell ask, you some of the stories oh, of what the kids ooh. did. Oh, oh yes, that's going to be interesting. Hey, Lita, thank you for doing it, and thanks for doing the show for uh, September twenty fifth at the Fireman's Hall. That's a Wednesday, ten thirty in the morning. Wednesday. Come on out. I just want to see, I want you to see the end of the show. Dave Landis is singing, listen very carefully, Butch written, uh, music written by Butch Nielsen, an extraordinary musician who is now is Dr. Nielsen. Uh, anyway, so here's the end of our And show. remember, it's never too late to live and learn. now we'll have to say goodbye. Thank you.